I can see it coming. Oh, it's feeling, sorry. Guys, I've been gone for two weeks. While I was gone, a lot of cool things came in. I just went down to the safe, and rather than doing a traditional unboxing, I picked some badass things that came in with my trusted expert, Marco. So stay tuned. Uh, we live Instagram. Yes. Lots of APs and paddocks and Rolexes came in. Surprise, surprise, surprise. I want to start off with the 16202 because I've yet to physically handle the 16202 in rose. The dial, the vignette is the proper way to fumé, pronounce it. Whatever you v vignette, whatever you want But basically what it means, it goes from darker to lighter, yeah. basically. A gradient. A gradient dial, exactly. Let's run through the difference, 15202 versus 16202. Yeah, so proportions-wise, they're gonna be very similar. The main difference, one is in the dial, and then two is in the movement, right? 15202 and all the previous Jumbo Royal Oaks would use the JLC 920 base movement. Probably the most famous of all time was used in the original Nautilus, original Royal Oak, original Overseas, the 222. They upgraded now with an in-house caliber finally, which fixed kind of some of the bugs, which were the quick set date namely, um, because obviously, you know, that's a 50 year old caliber, a little outdated, didn't have a quick set date. Now it does. Also, you get the 50th anniversary rotor. I know people think it's gimmicky. I'm going to say it again. Only one year production. I'm telling you five years from now, we're going to be saying, why don't we pick up these deals, especially now? And, especially there, and the right. reason for that is because look, with a dip in the market, with the fact that AP decided to just like roll them all out at yeah. once and flood the market, all of a sudden it became a no big deal. But these anniversary pieces, they do tend to be those collectible pieces in the future. It may not be, it may not be that hot today, but guess what? It will be a lot hotter in the future. Let's go with the 6501 uh, Richard Mille split second chronograph. It has the newer, Richard Mille case, this was introduced in 1103. Little extra details, the coloring of the dial that matches the two colors on the crown, the buttons, and everything about it is just put together, as they say, a true racing machine on a wrist. Obviously, this is the younger daughter or son of the RM004 split second chronograph. What are the difference internally in terms of the guts? Not to skip over you know, the incredible watchmaking of this, we're talking split second chronograph function selector. So what you're getting from this is probably one of the best, you know, sports watch cases with a very, very complicated movement. There's not like a tremendous amount of difference. It's going to be similar complications, but you're getting, you know, one of the most difficult to execute complications on the market, split second chronograph. Now, if from, I remember correctly, Michigan, right now, if I remember correctly, the zero four is where uh, they introduce a single clutch split second chronograph, yep. right? So if you, in lamest terms, if you think of a split second chronograph, there's two clutches that sort of push and pull, right? in order to execute yeah. the function. Again, I would draw it out for you, but I don't, we should put a blackboard up here. Actually, we yeah. Should, yeah, one it's of those, like dry, yeah, like, yeah. It's like the classroom type mm -hmm. of deal. But uh, that still exists within this movement just the same. Uh, I don't remember what the benefit was, whether it was just flexing. It's probably ease of use and also helps with shock resistance or absorbance, right? Because that's something Richard Mill has always, you know, prided themselves on is usability of their pieces, right? Split I mean, think Nadal playing tennis. So. Right. Split second chronographs being one of the more delicate uh, complications just because the amount of springs that are inherent in a movement like this. But I think ultimately they built it so that it could, you know, withstand wear and everyday use. Well, speaking of racing machines on a wrist, we talked about lately we've been on a kick of buying up uh, older limited edition offshores, right? Yeah. One of those and one of the better looking ones, in fact, I think me and Adrian discussed this last time, it made it into our top five, was the Yarno Truly. Yarno Truly, a not so famous race car driver. <laughs> if you're an F1 driver, you're one of 20 people in the world out of 360, what, how many billion? Seven, 7 .8 seven point eight billion people? I'm thinking America, right? But in the world, there are 7.6 billion people, and there are only 20 that get a seat as an F1 driver. So the fact that he's not Max or, you know, Lewis or any of those guys, just to be an F1 driver is a hell of an accomplishment. But when it comes to the watch, I think the color scheme on this watch is probably one of the best color schemes in a limited edition offshore that, I mean, I've seen them all, I've sold them all, I've bought them all. And this one made into mine and Adrian's top five, just based on its look, just the, the, yeah, the bezel. Carbon case, the bezel, the combination of the red racing colors with that carbon, I think just works so well. Mega tapestry dial in gray, kind of mixes all in with that carbon case. It just works, you know yeah, what I mean? I it mean, just I, works. Everything, everything about this watch works. And I think, like I said, it made it into mine and Adrian's top five, best looking limited edition offshores and these things, 
I've seen him making a comeback. I know Yarner Shuley's not making a comeback into F1, but <laughs> I do know that uh, the limited edition officers, now that the spotlight has been taken off the Royal Oaks a little bit, it's like history repeats itself. You know, yeah. offshores were hot, and then they kind of died, and then the Royal Oaks came in, and now it's like going the opposite direction. Where do we go? 5982 tone. This thing, I think, just came back from service, hence it's all taped up. Best looking two-tone watch out there? I mean, it's certainly one of the more prestigious ones, and I think, personally, one of the absolute best ones. It was one, actually, that I never held before. It was like, eh, on the fence, do I like the design? And then you hold it in person, and it's just like, wow, this is, you know, this is exceptional. 5980, originally in steel, released in 2006, was actually Paddock's first in-house chronograph movement. How crazy is that? Company's yeah. been around for so long. Yeah. It takes them that long to create their own chronograph. And that goes to show that what we discuss always, people always downplay the chronograph. Yeah. Oh, it's just a chronograph because it's taken for granted because every, you know, every major manufacturer out there will execute a chronograph, not realizing that a chronograph is still one of the most complicated complications to execute. Yeah. Maybe that's why it took Paddock so long to make their own, or maybe they just had money and bought it elsewhere. Now, this was the original pounder. Now you see many versions of the brick offshore, right? Which is the old gold offshore. You've seen it in various yellows, rose combinations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is the true one. And this is one of the last ones. This is an I believe it's an F serial. So this was one of the last year of production where they made the yellow gold with the white dial. And this is the one that weighs a pound, right? Yeah. The original pounder is for somebody that, first of all, to me, because it's been so many years at this point, it's starting to have that, uh, what does uh, Adam call it, the uh, neo-vintage look, yeah. right? Because with the white dial, I mean, if you really wanted to have a vintage, you go with the blue dial, which was the OG one. So by the way, we should be getting in the Beast, the beast the original yellow beast. gold, okay. sing single digit cereal. I'm not gonna say what it is, but it's coming. We'll find out soon. We'll find, Stay we'll, tuned. We'll, we'll sign out soon. But the original brick to me was for those that want to feel a watch on the wrist. Uh, it's a timeless aesthetic, right? I, I don't think anything in the Royal Oak silhouette I think is timeless. But, but it's that big hunk of gold. Yeah, like, you, it's just that, like, that is just impossible. To it's it's just, it's just mm, the Explorer cream dial, right? And a lot of you guys, uh, you've probably seen this posted on Instagram. The boys have posted and the girls have posted it, right? So if we're talking, watch this, ready? <laughs> Kyle, check it out. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> In such unison, I love it. <laughs> uh, cream dial. Tell, tell, tell the audience as to, first of all, why this thing turned cream. Yeah. So originally released, I think, in the mid 80s, and then it was discontinued around the early 90s. So only about a five or six year production run overall turned. So they did both a black and a cream color, the more collectible obviously being the cream because uh, originally they used the type of paint that now has developed a really nice patina. You see some in cream, some in salmon even. So the color combination is pretty incredible. <laughs> yeah. you, Marco saw this earlier in my office and he's like, holy sh is that what I think it is? Uh, I said, yes, Marco, this is a minute repeater turbion with a mother of pearl, what I would call a metropolis dial. It's like sort of looking through a fisheye lens. Is yeah, that it's also like reminiscent of like the world, like even on a, a paddock aquanaut, right? They have that kind of metropolis motif, but yeah, very much like a world kind of globe. Exactly. I mean, I guess the first metropolis that they came out was the perpetual, if you remember that one, that yeah. was in a millinery case actually. Yeah. And it looked like you were literally looking through a fish lens and that's what this dial gives off. But let's not discount the fact that this is a minute repeater turbion in a single watch. Let's see. If in we... platinum, by the way. In platinum. Which is uh, actually. I think watch. original list on this watch was 428,000. And this is, again, AP has consistently throughout the years has shown the world how big their dick is because this is where they started. They started with complications, right? They didn't, they did with for Tiffany and Co., I believe. And then, you know, they continue throughout it, even though this might be not a Royal Oak and not as popular and it doesn't hold its value as well. But when you're talking about value around, you know, $100,000 for a minute repeater turbine. Two of the most difficult to execute complications. And now put them together. Yeah, put them together. Work, make them work simultaneously. Let's see. I can't hear anything. I can't. It's going. You can't hear it? Yeah, I hear it now. You'll find a lot of value in, in watches like these from a major house like Audemars Piguet and sometimes even uh, Vacheron, all the holy trinities where I mean, people even overlook Paddock these. Will, yeah, Peter Paddock will even have like even the, those ellipse shaped uh, minute repeaters, for example, perpetual calendar. The, the 5101P. Yeah. The, the Super undervalued, extremely undervalued because they're in a kind of atypical format, atypical case, obviously AP known for the Royal Oak, but I think it's, it's so lost on people. I mean, we did a video, me and Alex together, right? For example, AP double balance wheel, right? The original 15307 
perfect watch. You know, they didn't need to upgrade it. Why they add the double balance wheel? It added, you know, 30% accuracy or increased accuracy to the watch. Again, AP really does focus on the watchmaking side of things, even though they just use the, the silhouette of the Royal Oak, but these are- I mean, you take this watch and you put it into a Royal Oak and you have a half a million dollar watch easy. plus. Speaking of Royal Oaks with complication, let's go to one of those and let's talk about anniversary pieces. We talked about yeah. the 50th, 50th anniversary, anniversary and we said how people right now, because the market is flooded and this is, the Royal Oak 25th anniversary Turbiac. This was made for the 25th anniversary of the Royal Oak in a limited edition surprise surprise of 25 pieces. Yeah. Right? Now, you're going to say, well, they made 5,000 of these, let's say. Right. I don't know exactly how many made those of the 16202. I think total production on the anniversary pieces was 20,000 pieces. Yeah. I believe so. You break them right. out throughout all the other ones and kind of try to figure out how many they made. If we're talking about 50th anniversary versus 25th anniversary, first of all, the yeah. production was probably one tenth of what it is today, right. and the demand was probably one tenth of what it is today. Hence, it's, it evens out the playing field because you have enough demand there. This has also been dubbed one of the ugliest clocks, by the way, is because of how awkward the Turbion cage is no. on the bottom. That's, but, I think it's so nice. But I think this watch is so ugly that it's pretty. Yeah. Honestly, honestly, it's 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 you that hate it or, or, or you, you you hate it or love it. To there's be no honest, I, I personally love it. Ingenious watch too. Crownless case, so that means there's no actual crown oh, yeah, we have to show on it the back of the watch, um, which makes it all the more That's special. Right? You rarely you will rarely see that ever in watchmaking. And again, testament to the fine watchmaking of Audemars Piguet using, for example, the Royal Oak silhouette. Uh, with that said. I'm gonna either go back 10 years or fast forward 15 years, and that's gonna bring us to the 40th anniversary of the Royal Oak, which at the time the 15202 came out for the 40th anniversary. And what they did then, in a limited edition, speaking of a heavy, heavy watch. Yeah, this is a heavy one. A platinum Royal Oak skeleton turbia. Now, as far as I'm concerned, Modern, still modern, Very right? Modern, yeah. uh, modern Royal Oaks, this is the Holy Grail. I can't yeah. think of any other Royal Oak that I would have on my wrist outside of this one and calling it a Grail. So for the 40th anniversary, surprise, they made a limited edition of 40 pieces in platinum, Royal Oak skeletonized. And this thing is just, mm. Mm. Rarest of the rare. This is as and, rare as it gets. And easily one of the nicest skeleton watches ever made. Add to it a tourbillon, add to it the Royal Oak case. I mean, you have a, a recipe for arguably one of the nicest design watches ever of all time. I think period. if this, I think this was the one watch that was missing from the Philips auction. At the time, Philips ran that auction for the 50th anniversary. I think this would have fetched upwards of a million bucks. I think so. And I, again, just because, I Phillips, mean, try finding, me. yeah, try, find, yeah, try finding another one on the market today. There, I, do know, I do know of one. Yeah. Uh, a collector, a collector has one of these. He's asking all the money in the world for right. it if you were to ever sell it. And it's one of those pieces that it's, it's, that's when people tend to realize. Unfortunately, it's human nature. Stuff becomes more attractive as it goes up in value. Once you start seeing certain cars go up in value, certain guns even, if you know, because I'm a gun collector, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, it becomes a lot more attractive, right? right. Watches when, you didn't you didn't love before, you certainly start to. When you walk when you walk into a boutique and this was sitting on the shelves and the guy offered you a 10% discount on, <laughs> on the watch, you were like, eh, it's not as attractive. All of a sudden, right. and the thing trades a quadruple re retail. All of a sudden, it becomes more attractive. But that's just how it is in life, and there's yeah. not, not really much you can do on it for those. For those that can see into the future, probably very, very well off. I do tend to, having been in the industry for 20 years, I do tend to foreshadow whatever you guys call that in the filming industry, right? I do have an idea based on my experience, some of the pieces that are gonna be there in the future, like the anniversary pieces. Right now, everybody, there's so many of them out there that everybody's like kind of shying away from them and they're afraid to spend money on them and so on and so forth. But we know based on experience. I mean, 25 all these, years, everything that we've 40, 40 here years, today, yeah. and now the 50 years. And guess what? 60 anniversary pieces are going to do just as well. 75th. 70 to 75. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll be around yeah. to see them. Right? That's today's unboxing. That's today's unboxing. Aroma, it's great to have you back. Always a pleasure. Instagram, thank you so much for tuning in. YouTube, like, comment, share, subscribe. Appreciate you guys tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time. Was that the, 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 the classic Marco? Did it? Did it? Did it?